Welcome to the Armor Report, everybody. Thanks for being here with me on a Saturday. We are going to get to a lot. I've got to cover a lot of things. We had another big week. It's been lots of fun. And here's what we're going to do. I want to address the Gilead situation, not only Gilead itself, but its effect on the market. Then what we're going to do is skip over to the cannabis couch because it looks like we've got some green shoots growing in our growth facility that we call a stock market. Okay, so it's time to start focusing. So we're going to talk about that. And then I'm going to roll over to the precious metal space to give you another update. It's a very interesting developing story. Um, and so what I want to try to do is give you guys an, an understanding of the enormity of the change that's going on in the precious metal space and then what it means for the investments we've got. Okay, so let's go over some ground rules as usual to get started. Um, do me a favor, there's the like button, right? Give me a like if you enjoy this. You guys can subscribe down below to either this channel or and and or the armorreport.com, right? Which is a website for armor insiders to get more in-depth analysis of what we're doing. You get one-on-one -on -one contact with me. You can be part of our Slack trading room all day long during trading hours. We're sharing ideas in that room. Okay. Um, let's um, don't forget that all this information I'm sharing with you, information that I use in my own personal account and for clients that I man manage money for through our interactive brokers relationship. Okay. So that's full disclosure. A lot of these stocks we already own. Okay. I'm not telling you what stocks to buy because I don't know you. Okay. If you want one-on-one -on -one consultation, become an Armor Insider. But for the sake of uh, this YouTube discussion, I'm sharing with you my thoughts of what I'm doing. And I hope that you can stand on my shoulders and reach higher and be more successful on your own from these conversations. Also, I wanted to thank everybody out there. All of you guys, I appreciate it. We just hit 1,000 subscribers today on YouTube. So thank you so much for that. All right. This is about quantum mental investing, I like to say. The combination of quantitative execution and a fundamental foundation. And that's the information edge I'm going to share right now. So let's leap right in. Gilead. I'm going to share a story with you. Armor insiders that are watching right now, forgive me, you're going to have to hear this again, but I wanted to share this with the wider YouTube audience. I discussed this with you yesterday in the morning meeting um, on, uh, on YouTube just for you guys. So let me go through what happened with, with Gilead. This is important on two levels. From a market standpoint, you can see clearly if we get a treatment for COVID, market goes higher. Okay. If we don't, market goes lower. <clears throat> so everybody who's part of the Armor Action Alert free email list, and you could become part of that by going to the website, armorreport.com and subscribing. It's free. I sent you out on Thursday night a discussion about what happened with Gilead. Okay. So what... So I'm just going to I'm just going to give you some color on that. If you didn't receive that and you're subscribed, just look in your spam folder or whatever, and you'll see a breakdown of what happened. Quick overview. Since the 27th of January, Armor Insiders, myself obviously, in my own personal account, we were adding Gilead at $63.83 a share. It was a double position size, extra big. So whatever your position size is, double it. That's what, he, that's what I was talking about, January 27th at 63 and change. The stock went into the 80s. The idea then was to book that profit, take a portion of those gains, and roll them into options. The idea there was to cauterize our risk. So everything I'm saying now to you guys going forward, please remember and understand Whatever happens, we're walking away with profits here at the Armour Report. Now, either we're going to make a lot of money because Remdesivir is successful, 
or we're going to get wiped out on the options and still walk away having made money. Okay? What I like to say is you have to earn the right to take the risk. This is an investment where you have to earn the right to take the risk. We earned that right because we put on a double position size at 63 and change in January. We had big gains. So whenever you hear me talk about options now and calls on, on Gilead, that's only because we earned the right to take that risk. Now, having said all that, what we saw two weeks ago on Thursday was an announcement. It was a leaked announcement of a positive result from the University of Chicago with 125 remdesivir patients, part of a 400 patient study, which is part of a larger 2,400 patient study here in the US. It was very positive. Market was up huge Friday because of it. Gilead was up 18% at the open that day. And now this is very interesting. On Thursday, in the Slack chat room, an insider asked all of us, what's going on with Gilead options? Huge amounts of open interest in the 80 and 85 calls that expired Friday, one day. What's going on? Now you have to always remember, there's a buyer and a seller, right? So if there's huge amount of call open interest and you think that's real bullish, don't forget, there's someone on the other side writing all of those calls collecting premium, which could be bearish, right? You got two guys. Who's bigger? Who's got the ability to manipulate the market on a one day basis? It's the question you got to ask yourself, okay? So what happened was we were talking about that in the Armour Slack chat room. I literally got up from my desk to grab a bite to eat, came back five minutes later, the market was imploding and Gilead was halted, gone down from $83 a share, halted at 76. Mass panic. <clears throat> what was the story? Headline in the Wall Street Journal, no, headline in the Financial Times, Remdesivir a flop, okay? Then we started to see the stories come out. Wait a minute. This was a non-peer-reviewed, unsanctioned release on the World Health Organization's website. Don't get me going on that. Don't get me going on the WHO. Okay? We only have so much time today. It was on that website for an hour. Then it was taken down. But the price of Gilead never recovered above $80 a share through Friday. All of those options were wiped out. Okay? And we found out that was an unsanctioned Chinese study. Hey, by the way, we knew that two weeks ago. Gilead announced they had suspended all their Chinese trials because they couldn't get enough people into the trials, right? Because the Chinese were running it and they were running it wrong. And Gilead said there's not enough information to make any um, comment about the success or failure. So it was old information written in a new headline created to collapse the stock the day before options expired. And that's why I tweeted out, if you follow me on Twitter, at Brett Rosenthal, B-R-E-T Rosenthal, or you can follow me on stock Twitch, hashtag Armor Report. <coughs> ARMR report. I tweeted out, we just saw a Gordon Gecko blue horseshoe moment live in the stock market. Now, if you don't know that sub reference, Wall Street, a movie from, you know, a long time ago, I, I shared the YouTube clip for you to see it so you could watch. And I wanted to let you know, this does happen in the stock market all the time. You can't hate it, it's just the way it is, but you need to be aware of the volatility. It's why one of the rules on the armor, rules of the road, which you can find on the armorreport.com, I have armor rules of the road, right? One of those rules is don't let the volatility get you off the bus. It's designed to get you off the bus of your best ideas. 
Manipulation happens all the time. I'm going to share a quick story with you. So what I'm saying here is, before I jump into that story, clearly whoever was writing all those calls knew that Financial Times article was about to drop or even called the Financial Times and helped them write that article. Right? And that guy collected tons of premium for a day. When I first got into this business, it's a true story. I want to share it with you so you understand the animal you're involved in when you're a stock market investor on a day-to-day -day basis. Does this matter long-term? No. But you have to understand what you're dealing with. When I got into the business officially in 1993, it's a true story. I bought shares of a medical products company. It was canned slim all the way which is the William O'Neill, How to Make Money in Stocks book that I recommended to you guys. Quarterly earnings blowing out, annual earnings blowing out. <clears throat> Great intellectual property around their device. Everything was working. I bought the stock. There was a 20% short interest in the stock. 20% of the shares outstanding were short. So I thought, oh, this is going to be great. They're going to have great earnings and blow out the shorts. We're going to get a short squeeze. Okay, about... I don't know, three or four, maybe a week later, three, four days, maybe a week later, story comes out in the Wall Street Journal. I kid you not. And it said this company is cooking the books. They're double counting revenue. Stock dropped 30%. I got blown out of my position. Okay? I didn't know what was happening. I called, I read that article, and in that article, they quoted a doctor in New York City who was working with the New York City Health Board or something like that, about, they literally quoted, put in quotes, this guy saying the product was a sham. I called this guy on the phone. I did my digging and I got this guy on the phone. And I said, could you just, I'm a shareholder of this stock, and can you just explain to me why you think they're cooking the books? I kid you not. He started screaming at me. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm sick and tired of these phone calls. I don't even know that company and he slammed the phone in my face, okay? A month later, I didn't know what to do with that at the time. I was new, I was just in the business. I was like, I don't know what's going on, okay? A month later, the company announced earnings. It was a blowout. The stock went up 50% in the, in, in the next three months, okay? I missed the whole move. When I did my forensic study of what happened, we saw there was 20% of the float short before that bogus negative announcement, after that 20, that thirty percent drop, we see that there's only two percent of the float short, and then the company blows out earnings and the stock goes up fifty percent. Here ends the lesson. Okay, it's going to happen. It's not just from the movie Wall Street. It happens, and I'm telling you, what went on Thursday in Gilead smells like a blue horseshoe moment. And it's not just those calls that got wiped out. There could have been a lot of short interest. And those shorts want to get out in front of the real news that's coming next week. And that was their opportunity. Happens all the time. Okay? Don't fight it. Don't get upset about it. Just understand it. And... What I like to say, one of the rules of the road, is you have to come up with your investing strategy when the TV's off and the market's closed and then execute that strategy ruthlessly, okay? So what did we do on our trading desk? We earned the right to take the risk. We own the call options. I don't care what happens on crazy news stories like that. I'm carrying this position until we see the results of the first U.S. trial. I'm either going to make a fortune or get wiped out on the calls. If you haven't earned the right to take that risk, you should not be trading the stock. Okay? Because it's a total crapshoot. And you don't need to trade the stock because if the news is good, the market's going to go up big. So you could be buying whatever stocks you want in the market. If the news is not good, 
It's going to be an ugly day. So you can hedge those positions somehow. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's move on. And of course, I see your guys are writing questions. I'm going to get to those questions at the end as usual. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about cannabis for a minute. Here we go again. <clears throat> I definitely see green shoots finally starting to pop up in our grow facility here. These stocks have gone dead quiet. I love the fact that nobody talks about them on CNBC anymore. Nobody cares. That's usually the best time to be buying stocks when no one's talking about it. We were buying gold and silver in March. Nobody was talking about it on CNBC. Now stocks are up big and we're getting brokerage recommendations. People are talking about it. Stocks are up huge. We have big gains all throughout our portfolio. So here we are in cannabis. No one's really talking about it. Everyone's written them off for dead. And yet we're seeing chart patterns of tight consolidation at multi-year lows and breakouts above the 50-day moving average. Let's go look at a chart. Okay. Oops, that chart is Sienna. That's just for Armour Insiders. Okay, that's a joke, guys. <laughs> CN is a 5G play. Check it out on your own. Okay, oops, that's not the stock. Okay, well, the charts were similar. Interesting. All right, this is a chart of um, canopy growth. I want to shrink it up for you. Okay, and I want you to see what I'm looking at here on the chart. Okay, all the way here, Let's draw a line for you. All right, this is the long-term support area. Okay. You can see this first structure right over here to the left where my cursor is. That was a perfect pennant blowout when the move got started back in uh, 2017. We've, we've given up all of those gains and we're setting up a bottom right at that price. And look at that. Another little pennant is forming here. So I'm going to move this so we can see it. Okay, by the way, look where, look, look where it bottomed out, canopy growth. Literally right down at the beginning of the whole move. And, and let's think about that for a minute. Let's think about that for a minute. It bottomed out. It gave up all of those gains. And yet, the company has $3.8 billion of cash in the balance sheet. That doesn't make a lot of sense. The prospects for the cannabis business going forward are great. This company's got $3.8 billion of cash in the balance sheet and it's trading at a price it was trading at in 2017 before the investment from Constellation Brands, before the new chief executive from Constellation Brands took over? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And so what we look for in the market is things that don't make sense to take advantage of, um, uh, of that situation from a fundamental standpoint, right? So now let's take a look at the chart again. And I just love the way this thing closed on Friday. All right, it's trying, it's trying. Let's, maybe I can blow it up here. Okay, now this 50-day moving average right here, this line right here, okay, exponential 50-day. I really want to see that thing close above it. It closed right on it on Friday, maybe two cents above it, I think it closed. And then in the aftermarket, it jumped another 25 cents. Okay. So let me tell you why I think that's so important. Um, let's go back to the entire decline starting back, back here, okay? The breakdown last year in May and June. As you could see, Canopy's trading below that 50-day moving average line almost the entire time. It peaked above it here and failed, right? Now it's trading below it again. So if it pops back above it, we should get a shimmy up here towards the 200 day. What we really need is a move above the 200 day to start the real bull market again. But what we want to do is get a piece on here and see if it can make its way to the 200. And then we know we've got something we can work with. Okay. So what we're looking at here, and I really think I've always said this, I think canopy growth drives the entire sector. If we can't make money in canopy, 
I really don't think we can make money anywhere else in the Canadian cannabis space. I particularly think that's true now with all the cash on hand and the CEO, the new chief executive from Constellation Brands. He's, let's look at what he's doing. Analysts a, a couple months ago on the earnings call wanted him to give projections for the year. And he said, guys, I've only been here three months. When I'm here six months, which is the next earnings announcement, I am going to re reveal for you what my thoughts and projections are for Canopy going forward. Everybody got, everybody got upset because he didn't release the um, drinkable product, which is the big story here for the company, right? And um, I submit to you, I think he didn't release it because nobody wants to bury the lead. He knew, number one, there aren't going to be a lot of big sales of the drink right now anyway. And number two, he's in the process of totally changing the company, closing grow facilities, bringing down the workforce to something manageable, cutting costs everywhere, getting the company in a position to be profitable, taking write-offs. So in the midst of all that, you don't announce a new product. You bury the lead in that. There's no point. I think what we'll see him do on the next earnings announcement is unveil his vision for the company and the new beverage product. Now, these are just guesses. This is the fundamental side of quantum mental investing. You can wait for that announcement. You can pay up for the stock if it's up big. What we're using is our quantum mental, the quantitative side of our quantum mental investing strategy and using the algorithms to tell us when is the risk reward right. The reward to risk right now is perfect. And so we're getting the risk on signal in canopy growth. Now, all of these ideas come with stops. If you're an Armour Insider, you can look at the Armour portfolios and you can see where we bought the stock, the price, the date, and what the stops are. We have three principal protection stops set up. Low of the day we bought it, low of the move we're buying, low of the structure we're buying. And you can use any or all three of those stops to come up with your risk management assessment and approach. Just because I think this is the beginning doesn't mean I'm going to be right. Our algorithms are not about neural networks and predicting the future and looking at a crystal ball. It's about getting on the right side of probability and statistics when reward is worth the risk. And that's what we're seeing right now in cannabis. So we put money to work and then we step aside. I don't have an ego. I don't care if I'm wrong. I use a stop. It takes me out. I reassess. I come back in the next time. It's worked well for all of you who have followed these rules since May of last year. We avoided most of the collapse. We've tried a couple times to put capital to work got stopped out, went lower. Okay, no harm, no foul. The net worth of our account's up for the year, right? We've earned the right to take this risk. We're going to go back at it again. I like Canopy, and then I have to go, if you want to know my other ideas that are on the top of the whiteboard, I'm going to share them because you guys know you've heard me talk about it. I think Afria's management team somehow is outperforming and thinking everybody else in the space, and I respect that. <clears throat> they also have a half a billion dollars of cash in the balance sheet, okay? Kronos, I can't stand the management team. They're just, a, they're just fumbling the football repeatedly, but they've got, you know, what, $1.7 billion on the balance sheet and a relationship with Altria. So, I don't know. I, I have a real hard time personally. I don't like buying stocks with management teams that aren't getting the job done. Uh, but the connection to Altria and the cash... You know, maybe I'll take a position, but it'll be half the size of the other two players. Okay? So those are my thoughts on cannabis. We can go over the other, other things in the Q&A. Let me wrap up with a discussion. This is very important about gold. Let's do an update. Um, I want to share this chart with you of Newmont Mining. I want to put this in context, what I'm about to say. Okay? The Armour Report is long gold down here on March 23rd. Long Newmont Mining, okay? Long Nova Gold, okay? 
okay? Long the Sprott Physical Funds, right in here. I didn't put it, make it green for you, but it's the same thing, the 23rd. Everything, that's where we stepped up. Now, we've added to positions to some, so we bought those names first, then we added to other names in the first couple of weeks of, of April, and we're experiencing massive run-up. So, on the one hand, what, what I like to tell you at the Armour Report, the whole point of the Armour Report is to help you learn the process of buying weakness in the midst of strength. So if you're going to ask me today, should I buy them up here? You don't need me to tell you about buying strength and hoping to sell higher, right? Buying high and selling higher. Uh, that's not why you come to watch this show. So I'm never going to advocate go pay up for stocks that are up huge. I'm going to say become an Armour Insider and when I put it on the uh, uh, into our portfolios, buy the stock, right? Because that's my suggestion. I'm buying weakness in the midst of strength. We had a strong uptrend. Take a look at it again in Newmont just for a second here. Just to give you an idea. And, and I know um, you guys have been asking me to do an Armour uh, uh, education video about chart pattern recognition and we're going to do that uh, on Monday at 4.30. But what we have here on Newmont is a perfect base Big breakout, so we know we're, we've got strength in the stock. Weakness because of a stock market crash. We buy the weakness when our trigger hits. And that's how you make a lot of money. That's a poster child for how you do it. Okay? So, put that aside for a minute. Now I'm going to talk to you about the fundamentals of precious metals. They're getting stronger and stronger every day. It's insane what's going on. I'm going to walk you through it as fast as I can. I'm going to look at my notes when I go to my... Try to, to try to stay focused, okay? On the 24th of March, the paper market seized up. We have COMEX futures and we have spot price London fix um, where you can actually buy physical, okay? The COMEX market froze up on the 24th of March. Why did it freeze up? I'm going to walk you through it. For years, the West, Western Central Banks, the, the Western bullion banks, JP Morgan, Goldman, these kind of guys, have been gaming the system in precious metals, gold in particular, silver as well. Silver, actually, I shouldn't say that. They're both gamed in a major way. What do I mean by that? There's unallocated gold in a pot. And then there's huge amounts of paper futures pretending that there can be delivery, but expecting that not everybody will demand delivery. So there's a lot more paper than there is physical. Do you understand that? You with me? If everybody demanded their physical from the comics, there'd be a force majeure. There's no way to deliver. 90 seconds. Okay. Okay, that's what, so that's the situation. Meanwhile, in the East, the Shanghai Gold Exchange opened. It's a physical market. It prices in physical. The East has been sucking physical out of the West as the West has been playing games with paper and unallocated assets. I always tell you when we buy bullion, we own the Sprott funds because it's allocated out of the banking system in a vault audited four times a year. Okay. There are, there are more shares of GLD than there could possibly be bars allocated to it. Okay. One day people are going to wake up to that. That's why I never say, don't, I say, don't buy me a GLD. Can it go up right now? Sure it can. But if we ever get into the market where people actually want the asset, they're going to say this asset is worthless because it's unallocated gold. We don't even know what's behind it. Okay. What's caused the run now? Gold was already in an uptrend starting last year. What's caused the run now is the black swan event of COVID-19. Two things happened. More people started to demand delivery of physical in a paper market that can't possibly deliver. And mines shut down. Um, mints shut down. 
So supply collapsed and demand for physical went up and you had a failure on the 24th of March. We now know it was UBS. They did not deliver on contracts. And so what we're seeing now in the physical market are premiums, rationing, and delays for physical. And this is why the price keeps going up. Okay? Now put on top of this, for a decade, governments were happy to suppress the price of gold because they were creating ridiculous amounts of fiat currency. And the only way you can really do that is to suppress something that is like a, you know, a siren that something's wrong with what the fiat currency system is, okay? <clears throat> now, we have a unique situation. I've already told you ad nauseum that gold was added to the tier one asset class, so banks can be buying gold as a tier one asset for their reserves. And we're in a world now where governments and banks are being stressed dramatically, right? Trillions and trillions of dollars worth of stimulus packages. How do you balance that balance sheet? You take the gold that you've got and you price it higher. In like in one fell swoop, you can start balancing the United States government's balance sheet. Okay? And banks for that matter. So now the guys who used to be suppressing the price are actually long the asset and hoping the price goes up. Okay? Um, so that's, the, that's it in a nutshell. So do I think the metals are going a lot higher? I do. I think they're going a lot higher. Can I, can I tell you to go buy Newmont in, in, already up huge? I won't do that. Right? I'm going to say become an armor insider and get the next wave. I have a surfing philosophy about investing. If you miss a big wave as a surfer, you don't keep paddling trying to get it. You're never going to get it. So what you do is you get back in position and you wait for the next set to roll in. At some point, the set will roll in for the metals, you'll get a shot. Or you got to go down the food chain and find mid cap to smaller cap names that haven't exploded yet. Okay, that's something you guys can do. Um, Okay, next week, uh, uh, options expire on Comex on um, the 20, um, on, on Monday, and the Bank of International Settlements biz on Thursday, okay? So, um, uh, normally there's weakness in the metals when you get OPEX. I don't know if we're going to see that, and the stocks last week did something very interesting. There were two days last week where gold and silver spot prices were down. And at the end of the day, GDX, HUI, the gold stocks were higher, which almost never happens and is very bullish because the gold stocks usually lead gold prices. So we'll see. I don't know what's going to happen next week. Um, all right, look, I, I had a breakdown for you of, of Newmont, but we're getting late. It's half an hour into this, so I'm going to answer questions now, and I'll do a, a Newmont discussion in the future. I just want to share with you the fundamentals of Newmont Mining. So you guys can understand the enormity of the opportunity in that company. Not that we're buying it now, but just so you can put it away in your brain. Every $100 increase per ounce in the price of the metal drops about $700 million down to the bottom line for this company. And every $100 per ounce decrease in costs, 25% of the cost being energy, drops $700 million down to the bottom line. It's sick, this company, and this is why it's been our number one stock and why we've always said this is the institutional favorite. All right, that about wraps it up for today. Let's get to the Q&A. Okay, Chris. <laughs> Thanks so much for that shout out on the hundred, on the thousand subscribers. I'm, I'm totally excited um, to, to get there and I've, I really thank all of you for helping me get there. It just feels good and I appreciate it. And can I just say that what you guys have been doing for me, allowing me to come on here and share my thoughts with you, it's making me a better trader and me a better investor. So it's a, I really want to thank you guys for that. <laughs> nice shirt. <laughs> That's right. You like that? There it is. For those about to rock, we salute you. This shirt I got uh, at the Roseland Ballroom when uh, ACDC was inducted into the um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It was a one-time concert and it was crazy in New York. All right, do you think Chegg 
could be a good stock to consider for holding long term. Tech Monkey. Um, Tech Monkey. Uh, how did you know? How did you know I was buying Chegg? How'd you know? Um, I absolutely do. Okay, I absolutely do. Let's take a look at Chegg for a minute. Maybe I maybe I posted it on on uh, on Twitter and I forget. Here's Chegg. All right, this is a classic cup and handle, right? That downtrending line is the handle. Okay, right in here, that green line. And we're buying it right down here after a brokerage downgrade. Thank you very much for the broker for downgrading it and bringing it right to the 250 day moving average. And so we're in the stock right here, actually, on the 22nd. And there it goes. Um, I think Chegg is definitely an example um, of a new economy uh, company that benefits. Um, it all, their business only accelerates through a, a COVID crisis. Oh, can I share one more thing with you guys? I forgot to show this to you, and I really want to share this. This is a chart. This is about gold. This is a chart about the euro gold relationship. You're going to see that euro gold has already blown out to all time highs, leading US dollar gold. Check this, check this out. There you go. All right, look at that. That's, that's Euro gold. Euro gold has already broken out last week, blew out to all, that's all time new highs on gold priced in euros. I just wanted to show you guys that because I thought it was real interesting. Okay. US dollar gold hasn't blown out yet. I think the number would equate to something over $2,000 an ounce for it to be the same as where euro gold is. Okay. Um, off topic, Chris King. Okay. You've done any research on Bitcoin? Um, I, I don't have, I, I've done a lot of research on cryptocurrencies. I did a lot of work on it. Um, we can discuss it at another time, but the bottom line is I don't have any interest in cryptocurrencies particularly not for the armor report. The reason being, this is all about risk management. I try to share with you guys my thoughts about making money by managing risk. In order to manage risk, I need liquidity and I need transparency. And I don't think you get either in Bitcoin. So if you want to have fun with it, can you make a little money? Can it skyrocket? Absolutely. But for the type of capital that I'm managing, my own personal money, when I'm managing capital for individuals, there's just no way I'd be touching that, you know? I, and, and I'd rather have more money in gold, silver. I'd rather, it, before I would ever get to Bitcoin, I would go down the food chain in gold and silver and buy small cap gold and silver stocks. I think I can get the same massive upside and, and still it's better liquidity and transparency. You know, and I just, I don't even know how to protect that investment. Now, I know we can go buy the ETF of Bitcoin, um, but not for me. I mean, it's a trading vehicle. You could certainly trade it and have some fun, but not for me. Um, did you buy more in the money calls on Gilead? Uh, I've got, uh, that's uh, before um, fun times. I, I've already got my situation on. I don't, I don't add more in the midst of the mania. You know, I, I create my investing plan when the TV's off and the market's closed, right? And then I execute ruthlessly and I don't let massive hysteria and uh, false information and stocks halted and then rocketing higher change how I manage my portfolio. So I've already got, I mean, if you knew how many options I've got personally, you, I mean, I don't need any more. I'm done, you know? Um, and, and, and the reason also is, look, I don't know what Gilead's going to say next week. I mean, they announced earnings on the 30th. My guess is they're not going to announce the results of their trial until they announce earnings. They're going to say, here are our earnings and here's the trial results. That's my guess. I don't know. Could come out <laughs> Sunday night for all I know. Um, and, and I have no idea what that result's going to be. I just have a feeling and a belief that it's going to work. I don't know. The whole thing could blow up my face. I'm going to get, my calls are going to get wiped out. So, I mean, how much risk do I need, you know? 
Okay. Um, Tech Monkey, uh, is buying MJ a good idea? I, I, you, you can buy MJ. I mean, I don't have an interest in buying MJ. I don't like a lot of the stocks that are in MJ. I only like a handful of cannabis names. So I think these names with all the cash and good management teams will way outperform MJ. And what I like to do on my personal account is buy the individual stocks. When they start going up, if there's a day or two where I'm uncomfortable, I actually short the ETF to hedge the risk on my individual stocks. So I'll day trade short the ETF while I let the individual stocks trade normally following normal stop rules. So it's rare that I buy the ETF. I know I used to talk about it, but I'm complete. I don't like I don't like half three quarters of the things that are in there. It does have an interesting uh, dividend, though. Um, all right. Emil, morning, Brett. How are you, my friend? He's tempted to step into Gilead. Okay. How would I play it if I decided to proceed? Half position, tight stops. Okay. If, if you want to play Gilead anyway, um, certainly smaller position size makes sense. So get a piece, but not a piece that's going to kill you if the stock drops, you, you know, I don't know, 25%, 50%. Who knows how much the stock would go down if it's a bad trial? I don't know because there's so many people in there. I mean, the stock would probably at the very least go back into the 60s, right? And there's there's so many people playing it, it might drop below the 60s for a short period of time. So um, small position size. Um, don't kid yourself, Emil. Stops are not going to help you. If the news is no good, it'll be halted and it'll be open dramatically lower. So the stops won't help you. So the other way to play it is to know your risk and just use call options. You take a small amount of capital, buy the calls. Either you get wiped out or you make a fortune. That's all. And if you want to, let's, let's say the news is good and the thing skyrockets. I mean, I don't know your portfolio. I don't know what small means, okay? Um, and, and not just you, but everybody. So I, I'm just saying, let's say you were willing to lose $5,000. Literally, you said, I don't care if I lose this or not. It doesn't matter. Okay, fine. Go buy the calls that somewhere in May, okay? Um, you could do June if you want because we're going to get the NIHD um, um, uh, data sometime in mid-May. So maybe the May 15s don't work anymore, right? They're going to work right now because we're going to get Gilead data first. But if you want further out calls, maybe you do June. And... Um, um, but this is your personal preference. I'm not telling you what to do, but you're asking me my opinion. I'm just saying, take the, the five, whatever the number is. I'm just using 5,000 as an example. Could be 2,500. I don't know. Whatever's, whatever you, you can stand getting wiped out on and it doesn't hurt you. Okay. And if the news is good and the thing skyrockets and you want to literally be long Gilead for the next couple of years, you can exercise those calls and own the stock. So that's a way for you to get into the investment long term, but know exactly what your risk is. Because there's no way of knowing what our risk is if the news is negative. They're going to kill that stock. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Okay, so some of the smaller gold mining stocks, ID Doc, um, Ego, uh, EGO, Harmony. <clears throat> I'm going to do some work on those, try to dig into my favorites. Uh, um, I already know my favorites, okay? I like to focus on stocks where, where companies where they have properties in the North America region, the U.S. and Canada and Australia. I think those are the safest places to own gold mining companies because there's rule of law. I don't think those governments will eventually take over and nationalize gold mines, okay? But if gold goes up far enough and things get strange enough, who knows what happens, you know, Argentina, these places, um, uh, Peru, I mean, who knows? Who knows what happens? So I just like to focus on governments where I feel comfortable. And no offense to anybody um, in those countries, right? But 
there's been times where governments just nationalize oil fields, you know, gold mines. <clears throat> so from a long-term standpoint, you probably don't have to worry about that now, but I'm, I think out long-term, I'm trying to buy positions. Maybe I hold them for a long period of time. And I just think of the end game and it's like, I just, I want to make sure I'm in, um, uh, I own companies that are situated in political areas that I feel confident. But I'll do some work on those names, get back to you. Oh yeah, Tech Monkey. Yeah, yeah, I put the chart pattern of <clears throat> Chegg up on Twitter. Um, Nick. Um, not sure what that VSTM is about. But I, okay, I'll take a look at that. VSTM, VSTM. I have to do some research there. <clears throat> Veristem, okay. Um, hey, Emil, I really appreciate that. I'm glad you're, in, you're enjoying what's going on inside the armor trading room. Uh, let's see. WMT calls. WMT call. Um, I don't have much thought on Walmart there. Uh, not a bad looking chart pattern. You know, that's the other thing about the stock market. It, the S&P closed above the 50 day moving average on Friday in a very quiet fashion. No one's really talking about it. But that's two weeks in a row that it closed above the 50. You know, the NASDAQ 100 is above the 50 and the 200, uh, 200 day moving average. And you're getting a slew of fantastic breakouts on, you know, leadership companies. So the fear that the market goes a lot lower, I mean, certainly it's out there because we look at the economy and the world around us and it's a little scary. But the market just focuses on liquidity, guys. And the liquidity is coming in bigger than any time in history. So. Okay, um, uh, Nicholas, are there any potential headwinds for the precious metals miners to take a breather? Of course, always. I mean, they're all up so much and the headwinds next week. We should see metal prices go lower into OPEX and you might get a couple days where, you know, they bring down the mining companies. I thought it was going to happen last week. It didn't, but it could certainly happen next week. So we'll see. Number two, should we be shifting some position sizing from large mid tiers to juniors. Newmont is already at, uh, okay. Um, I'm, you could do whatever you want. You're asking what I'm doing personally and for people I manage money for it. There's no possible way I'm letting go of um, my Newmont position. I, I, and, and I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna do a breakdown for Armor Insiders. I'm gonna do a video just for you guys about the fundamentals of Newmont mining because it's, it's very important. I think you understand what's going on in that company. It's the, the, the enormity of the opportunity cannot be um, overstated. So uh, I'm not touching that position, but looking for the juniors. Yeah. I mean, if you want to take on more risk, we can look for some juniors, you know, um, and we already have some in the portfolio, right? You can go take a look at the armor portfolios and see some of the stocks in there. There's a couple juniors. Okay. And I might add some more, but I wouldn't add some more unless we got that sell off that you're asking me about. Let's get a sell off. You know, maybe we get a sell off this week because of OPEX and we get an opportunity to buy some of the, you know, smaller names. We could talk about that. Now ask me again, you know, in the Slack trading room during the week. Um, Okay, great, great question. Um, before fun times, okay, uh, the U.S. MSOs, and you talk about Green Thumb, was up 30% this week, and I won't buy them. Why not? Hey, man, have at them. I'm not stopping you from buying them. Go make some money. I'm happy for you. But there's a certain amount of responsibility I feel when I come on YouTube and when I share information with Armor Insiders. It's to manage risk. It's the whole reason I created this channel. Okay. And there is risk in buying Canadian 
stock exchange stocks. There's a risk in the liquidity when things go south in those names. And it makes me uncomfortable. Number one. Number two, I find a lot of other ways to put exposure to cannabis in my portfolio. So it's also an opportunity cost of money. I can't dance with everybody. So I got to narrow the field down to what suits me, what's, what's comfortable for me. If you're comfortable buying something on the Canadian Stock Exchange, have at it. Don't let me stop you. But for me, I'm just not comfortable there. I like liquidity. I like to put money where I think institutions can put money. And let me tell you for a fact, institutions can't put money in the Canadian Stock Exchange. So that limits the pool of people that are putting money into the stock. And it creates wilder volatility. Go look. I know, I know, um, well, I don't know. Actually, I, I don't think you are an Armour Insider. But we have a small cap stock that's in our portfolios where I think there's massive upside. But it trades here in the U.S. and it's a cannabis company. So I've, I've found other ways to play the U.S. MSO um, opportunity as opposed to just buying the MSOs. And that's my thought. But please don't let me stop you if, that's, if you're comfortable with that. Um, Armour Report t-shirt. <laughs> I love it. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll make them up. Um, what about oil stocks? If they're bottom, is there an opportunity? All right, Nick, I totally think there's an opportunity in oil. And if you checked... I know you're an insider. If you check the, um, the whiteboard this week, I added two oil stocks, okay? Um, and I don't mind sharing it with everybody. I added Exxon and Chevron to the whiteboard. Now, the whiteboard's like the minor leagues for us, right? All the names we like, the names we're doing research on are on the whiteboard. And then the question is, will they get the call up to the majors and go into an armor portfolio? I'm not ready to put oil into an armor portfolio, on the one hand, it's opportunity cost of money. I just got so many other places we're going right now and we're making a lot of money in, in other places. So I just don't have the room for them. But the other reason is after a collapse like this, I think the energy sector really needs to set up a base of at least three to six months. It's not that they can't rock it off the bottom, but my guess is there'll be a pattern that'll form in here over the next three to six months and I'll get a shot at them. And that's probably what I'll do. You know, they'll run up to their moving averages, then they'll sell off, make a double bottom or a higher low. And then we maybe we'll say, hey, we've made so much money in these other names, let's book some profits and roll them into this idea. So it's kind of a further out thought for me. Um, hey, Tech Monkey, I really appreciate that. I hope you guys all understand. I'm trying to share with you my knowledge from 30 years of doing this so that you can reach higher and be more successful. That's what I'm trying to do. Katie, I have a, a micro lot size of GOLD. Um, you're so I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about um, Barrick, Re you know, Barrick Resources. I, I love that company, great company, GOLD. I don't own it, um, I, but you could own it. It's you know right after Newmont, it's the next big play. Um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you're asking me if you would sell it. I mean, I, you, you, Katie, you got to make that decision for yourself, right? It's more than four standard deviations above the 200-day moving average. It's in rarefied air. All of these stocks are. If you want to book some profits up here, have at it. you got to do what's comfortable for you, right? Trade around the core is what I say. What's your core holding that you don't want to let go? And the rest, you sell when it's high and you look to buy it back when it comes down. So you trade that piece around the core. Oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Okay. B4 fun times. That's Brian B. Excellent. Okay. Um, glad, glad to know you joined us, my friend. I didn't know that was you. And Chris, thanks for giving us that information. They increased their dividend? When was that? I got to check that out. All right, guys, look, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. I'll give you one more second to um, ask a question if you've got it. Anybody else out there? And then I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up.
No? Okay, great. Well, if I miss a question, don't forget you can comment right here in the uh, comment section of this video and I'll answer anything that I've missed. Oh, okay, one last one from Emil. Brad, do you consider consistent yearly goal of 30% growth for principal for a regular investor realistic and achievable? Um, I don't think it's realistic and achievable. Consistent 30% growth year in and year out as an equity investor is rarefied air. Now, if you want to say to me over a 10 year period, you're going to look back and see that you had on average 30% growth, maybe that's achievable, but there are going to be some years in there where things just don't go right. And other years in there where you have big runs. And then some years in there where there's just nothing to make, but right? you don't get a move. It just, sometimes the market just kind of meanders and flatlines and you just, you can't get a move. What we're getting right now, we're having explosive net worth growth in our portfolios right now because we're in a unique volatile time where the market crashed. We were out before it crashed and then we stepped in big time right near the bottom and we're having this huge run. That is not normal. So you get into a normal year with normal volatility and you have to have normal expectations of what you can, what you can do. So I would never say that I can expect to do that constantly. We strive for it, you know, we strive for it. But realistically, I can't say it's expected. All right, guys, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate your time and I look forward to seeing you guys on Monday. 4.30, you guys have been asking me to do a clinic about chart patterns. And so what we're going to do is literally go over charts. I'm going to show you what I would say, you know, past great winners. And we're going to see here's the entry point and look what it led to. Here's the entry point. And so if you, when we're done with that discussion on, on Monday afternoon, you'll have an understanding of what you can look for. You say, okay, you might want to pause the video, cut um, these charts that I'm going to show you, print them up, put them on the wall over your head. And then as you're going through investment ideas, look to see, does it look like these patterns? Am I finding these patterns? That's how I learned. I did it with William O'Neill's service way back in you know the, the late 1980s, early 1990s. My college dorm, it was just my whole walls were covered with chart patterns of past great winners. So we'll start doing this on Monday. Okay, guys, take care. Have a great weekend.